Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our midweek reflection uh, on this very interesting day, which um, is a day of thanksgiving for the institution of Holy Communion, and uh, the old Latin word for it was Corpus Christi. And I'm going to begin with the prayer of today. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that in this wonderful sacrament, you have given us the memorial of your passion. Grant us so to reverence the sacred mysteries of your body and blood, that we may know within ourselves and show forth in our lives the fruits of your redemption. For you are alive and reign with the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay, uh, Corpus Christi, I've, I've sort of given it away. I mean, the, it's the Latin words for the body of Christ. And um, it's quite an ancient festival. It's not that ancient. It's not going back to the time of Jesus, but it's uh, medieval. And it was always celebrated on the Thursday after Trinity Sunday, which is today. Um, and it was instituted as a, a thanksgiving for the fact that Jesus gave us Holy Communion. Now, I'm sure you, and, and, and I know I've thought this in the past, would think actually Maundy Thursday is probably the most appropriate moment to have uh, that remembrance of Holy Communion, because that's the day at the Last Supper when Jesus broke the bread and said, this is my body, share it amongst yourselves. And he took the cup and said, this is my blood shed for you. But because, and I think I, I can see the logic of this, because Maundy Thursday is the day before Good Friday, and the whole emphasis is on the fact that Jesus is about to die on the cross for the sins of the world and rise from the dead, to get really too excited about Holy Communion might have been a distraction from Christ's passion. And therefore, that's why it was moved to a separate occasion to celebrate it. And uh, we have a woman to thank for this festival, you'll be pleased to know. Um, uh, a nun from um, Liège in uh, France called the Blessed Juliana, who had a vision about the year 1230 of this idea of remembering um, Holy Communion on a particular day. She shared her vision with the Pope and in 1264, Pope Urban IV made it official the celebration of this remembrance of Holy Communion on this day. But sadly, uh, Corpus Christi began to be abused. And in fact, the whole celebration of Holy Communion over the centuries began to be abused. It, this was partly because um, the belief of the church was what is called transubstantiation. I know it's a terrible long word, but it's the idea that at the celebration of Holy Communion, when the priest blesses the bread and the wine, the bread and the wine actually become physically the body and blood of Christ. They change, the substance is transformed. That's what um, the word means. So you can just imagine people coming to church very, ordinary people, but perhaps simple people. And they believed that it was actually Christ's flesh that was being put into their hands or probably more realistically put into their mouths. They didn't touch it with their hands and Christ's blood that they were drinking. And lots of superstition occurred and people would go into church and when they were given communion, they would steal the wafer and take it home. I've got Christ's body in my house. Nothing can touch me because I've got the body of Christ. And people abused the wine and drank too much. I have to say, this is a bit of an aside, but before we stopped Holy Communion, there were some people that used to worry me in church, in both our churches, who would get hold of the uh, cup and, and I'd be thinking, well, don't guzzle too much of it. You know, this is pretty potent stuff. But people were abusing the wine, people were getting drunk. And that's one of the reasons why um, the, the chalice was denied for many years to uh, people in the church. And in fact, if you go to some traditional Roman Catholic churches today, they still don't have the wine. Um, it's only the priest who takes the wine. And it's all because of that abuse um, from the past, which is very, very sad. 
So when it came to the Reformation in England, so we're talking, you know, um, 1530s and 1540s when Henry VIII was <laughs> doing his thing and uh, Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, was um, reforming the church. When the prayer book was brought out, um, Corpus Christi was abolished. The festival was abolished because people were abusing it so much. And in fact, the belief in transubstantiation was denied by the Church of England and, and other reformed churches. Um, I, I'm going to read you a little bit out of the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, if you've ever got to the back of the prayer book, you will find this wonderful statement called the, the 39 Articles of Religion. I have to warn you, you need to be in a good frame of mind to sit down and read them all in one hit. Um, but they are a bit old English, but they do spell out um, the belief of the church. And um, when it comes to transubstantiation, one of the articles about the Lord's Supper says this. Um, well, I'll read it all. Of the Lord's Supper, it's, it's quite remarkable. The Supper of the Lord is not only a sign of the love that Christians ought to have among themselves one to another, but rather it is a sacrament of our redemption by Christ's death. In so much, sorry, in so much that to such as rightly, worthily, and with faith receive the same, the bread which we break is a partaking of the body of Christ. Likewise, the cup of blessing is a partaking of the blood of Christ. Now, this next bit is very important. Transubstantiation, or the change of the substance of bread and wine in the supper of the Lord cannot be proved by holy writ. That's the Bible, by the way, holy writ. Um, but is repugnant to the plain words of scripture, overthrow the nature of a sacrament and has given occasion to many superstitions. The body of Christ is given, taken and eaten in the supper only after an heavenly and spiritual manner. And the mean whereby the body of Christ is received and eaten in the supper is faith. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper was not by Christ's ordinance reserved, carried about, lifted up or worshipped. Now you think, oh, that's pretty strong, but it's, it's true. I mean, we believe that we feed on Christ spiritually. And I, I don't doubt that the body and blood of Christ is very real and very present in the bread and wine that we eat but it hasn't changed. When we take the bread and when we drink the wine, we are feeding on Christ spiritually. Now, as you know, at the moment in lockdown, we're not even able to take the bread and the wine, but we're still feeding on Christ spiritually. And, and we, we have to, uh, well, I, I think it's really important that we do believe that. I mean, I'm very happy to talk about this a bit later, but um, the thing is that the definition of a sacrament in the Church of England is it's an outward sign of an inward spiritual grace. In other words, a sacrament is an outward sign of something within us that we believe to be true. Now, there, there are two gospel sacraments in the, um, in the church, which I mentioned them last week, and that's baptism and Holy Communion, because those are the two things that Jesus himself commanded us to do. Everything else is all valid, but he didn't command us to confirm people, but we do. He didn't command us to marry people, but we do. Um, those are other things called sacraments. Uh, he didn't command me to be ordained, but ordination is still regarded as a sacrament. It's an outward sign of something we believe to be true. But the two he commanded us, baptise people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and remember me, Jesus said, every time you break bread and drink wine. And I think that's that's really, really important. But because we're Christians. It's true for us. Marley has come to join the Bible study. Hello, Marley. Um, it, it, it's true for us. So in other words, when um, I, I know I said this last week, but when we baptize somebody. Me pouring on the water doesn't make them a Christian. They are a Christian because they believe or they're in the case of a baby, their parents believe because their parents are Christians and they want their baby to be baptized into that faith. And it's an outward sign of what we believe to be true. 
Similarly, as we shall see from the, the gospel reading in a minute, um, the what we have in the uh, in the bread and the wine is that Jesus commanded us to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood. And if we do that, we have life within ourselves. Well, of course, if we believe, we have eternal life. So taking of bread and wine is an outward sign of the fact that we know that we have eternal life. Okay, I don't want to blitz you too much. I'm going to pause there and read the two bits set for today, which are quite important. So the, the epistle, the letter, if you want to follow it, it's from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you've got a Good News Bible, um, it's on page 215 towards the back in the New Testament, page 215. Um, by the way, had a lot of very positive comments about Chris and Jackie taking part in the service on Sunday and reading and praying. And um, I'm already working on Rota to get other people involved. So you'll be pleased to know it won't just all be me. <laughs> and I'll be getting them to do a bit more as well. Doreen's one of them who's volunteered, so which is nice. Um, OK, so 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm beginning to read at verse 23, which is in the right hand column of page 215, if you've got the Good News Bible. And this is Paul writing to the Corinthians and talking about Holy Communion. For I received from the Lord the teaching that I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a piece of bread, gave thanks to God, broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is God's new covenant, sealed with my blood. Whenever you drink it, do so in memory of me. This means that every time you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And while we're in the Bible, let's read the gospel. Um, the gospel for today is uh, from John chapter six, and it's on page 125 in the New Testament part of the church Bibles, page 125. And it's the gospel according to John chapter six, and uh, I'm beginning at verse 51, which if you've got the Good News Bible, it's at the top of the right hand column where Jesus is speaking. And uh, very familiar words, these will be to you, but page one, two, five, Gospel according to John. Seeing as we are having our midweek service, I'm going to use the uh, introduction that we would normally have at Holy Communion. If you want to respond, that'd be lovely. Hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give him is my flesh, which I give so that the world may live. This started an angry argument among them. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They asked. Jesus said to them, I'm telling you the truth. If you do not eat of the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you will not have life in yourselves. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life and I will raise them to life on the last day. For my flesh is the real food, my blood is the real drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood live in me, and I live in them. The living Father sent me, and because of him, I live also. In the same way, whoever eats me will live because of me. This, then, is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the bread that your ancestors ate. They later died, but those who eat this bread will live forever. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So, Jesus is very clear. And, and of course, the bread that your ancestors ate, he's talking about, is when uh, they were wandering through the desert and the manna came down from heaven and they ate the manna and that's how God fed them. And he, Jesus is saying, you know, yeah, 
it kept you alive then, but you subsequently died. That the real bread from heaven, Jesus is saying, is me. Um, I came down from heaven to feed you. And of course, we've we've been thinking about Good Friday and Easter and that sacrifice of Jesus dying on the cross, his body being broken and his blood being shed are what he told us to remember him by in um, Holy Communion and to proclaim his death until he comes again. And it's to proclaim salvation for all. Now, because we believe that if you believe what Jesus has done for you, you will live, you have eternal life. But what is important is that we come together to worship God in church. And I, for one, am completely frustrated that we can't do that at the moment. Not just to worship God, but to break bread together, to eat bread and to drink wine, to remember what Jesus has done for us. It's very, very important. Now, um, and I'm not, um, please don't think I'm doing any other churches down, but one of the reasons that that belief in the change in the bread and wine was abolished at the Reformation was because, because of the abuse. But to this day, um, Roman Catholics believe that um, unless you actually go to mass and unless you actually take bread and wine, which is changed into the body and blood of Christ, you haven't got eternal life, which is why um, all good Catholics want to receive mass before they die. If, if they can have it on their deathbed, that really, really helps out because there, there would be no hesitation then about where they were going to end up. And I couldn't live with that uncertainty. I, I could not live with that uncertainty. Jesus promised that whoever believes in him has eternal life. If you've said, Jesus, come into my life, you have eternal life. You are saved. End of discussion. OK, full stop. You, that's it. You are saved. But what you need to do, what we all need to do is come to church when we can and remember what Jesus has done for us. Break bread, drink wine as often as we can. I mean, not ridiculously, but every week. Some people do it every day. It, it's it's important part of the decision. Similarly, we need to be baptized. We need to show that we have made our commitment to Jesus and that we are saved. Now, um, in the, uh, but as I say, sadly, I, I want my Roman Catholic brothers and sisters to have assurance. You're saved. You're with the Lord. You're not going to go to purgatory, believe it or not, because purgatory doesn't exist. So you haven't got to be bothered about it. Um, if you've committed yourself to Christ and you're worshipping with his flock and you've received Holy Communion, you've been baptised, all those outward signs, you're saved. Your name is written in the book of life. And on that great day, um, you know, when St. Peter's ticking off the list, you'll be there. <laughs> Come in. And Jesus is there. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and uh, enjoy the kingdom that was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, that's not me talking. That's Jesus. That's fantastic. What a wonderful, wonderful promise. And we should not abuse that. Now, I, I, I have to say, um, we're not in normal circumstances at the moment, sadly, but um, of course it's important to take communion. And for people who are coming towards the end of their life, it's, it's very, very important because they feel assured. There's a actually a wonderful service that I have... Um, used which i which i've literally borrowed from the roman catholic church although there's an authorized version of it in the in the church of england's liturgy but the service is called viaticum and it literally means food for the journey and i think it's a very beautiful moment when i've been able to do this with people that as they're dying they've been able to receive holy communion because it in the words of this this service it's like food for the journey it's strengthening their commitment because the next thing they're going to know is resurrection and being with the lord and let's be honest wouldn't it be great if we were all in that position and we were able to take holy communion 
in those last few moments before we died. It doesn't always happen. Sadly, I've been called to hospitals to see people and the person has died before I've got there. But it doesn't matter because Jesus is with each one of us. And if we've made that commitment, we have eternal life within ourselves. If we can strengthen that faith, um, and of course, you know, with, with people who've been in hospital, obviously I've been able to go and give them communion um, over a period of days and weeks and so on before the inevitable has happened. But even if that last bit hasn't been able to happen, that person is still cared for by Jesus. They have eternal life. And it's very, very important to remember that. A sacrament is an outward sign of something that we believe to be true. Now, let's be honest, if we, if, if we had to rely on the sacraments for salvation, we'd all be up the creek without a paddle at the moment because we've not been able to go to church for months. We've not been able to take communion for months. And it's one of the reasons why I've not been taking it. I mean, our bishops have given us permission for priests to take communion on your behalf. But my feeling is if you're fasting from bread and wine, I'm going to fast with you. I don't think I should sit in front of the screen doing it in front of you and you all sitting there thinking, well, he's able to do it. Why can't we? No, brothers and sisters, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't be that horrible to you. Um, my feeling is if, if you're not allowed to receive, if we're not allowed to gather to do it together, then I'm not going to receive either because I trust we're all good Anglicans. Um, we're all feeding on Christ spiritually, whatever happens. Yes, it would be great if we could take the bread and wine and we will do so as soon as we are able to. But in the meantime, um, it's important that we remember that Christ has died for us, he's risen from the dead for us and we can actually feed on him spiritually. Um, a couple of other things to, to sort of say, and that's that um, if you'd probably notice from those words from 1 Corinthians, that, that those are roughly the words that we use in church. And that's why, because Paul the Apostle has um, passed on the tradition and we use those words, the words of our Lord. Uh, incidentally, they're very similar to the words of the Last Supper in Luke's Gospel, which makes a lot of sense because Luke we understand, was the companion of Paul on his travels. So Paul is probably getting a lot of his information about what happened in the gospel from Luke. And that's why the um, Last Supper story is very, very similar. But, um, but it is important that we, we pass things on because, bit of a wordplay here, but you'll, you'll have to forgive me for throwing in a few words. Um, you may have noticed it's, and we say this in church, don't we? In the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. Now, this is very, very important because the word that we translate as betray um, literally means to hand over. So uh, in, um, in more modern liturgies, and I think this is a, is a, a bit sadly, in more modern liturgies, unfortunately, um, because in our world today, our no blame culture, we don't like the idea of betrayal. It often says in the night that Jesus was handed over, he took a piece of bread. But we all know that Jesus was betrayed because Judas, for whatever reason, although probably because for him, Jesus wasn't turning out to be the kind of Messiah he wanted, um, or whether it was for that financial gain or whatever, but he he turned him over he betrayed him now it's it's the same word that's used of passing on the tradition so you have to be very careful that you pass on the tradition correctly um just to use the words in case you're interested the, the greek word in the new testament is paradidomi which means to to pass on which can also be um translated to betray and when that gets translated into latin it's the word tradito from which we get the word tradition so the word tradition can actually mean to betray in other words the church has been given this precious precious stuff 
to pass on to everybody else. We have been given the words of eternal life to give to everybody else. We've been given the Bible, the word of God to pass on to everybody else. And how we do it is crucial because if we pass on the tradition incorrectly, then I believe the Lord will hold us to account. You know, when I was um, ordained, I'm, I'm, I'm getting carried away here. I'm, get, I'm actually going to get the, the, the bit that I had to swear allegiance to. Hang on a minute. Um, I, I'm saying this because I just think it's really important. Um, Right, I'm going to read the, the preface. When I got ordained, anybody who wants to take any part in the Church of England has to listen to this. The Church of England is part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Catholic means universal, by the way. Worshipping the one true God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. It professes the faith uniquely revealed in the Holy Scriptures and set forth in the Catholic creeds. Which faith the church is called upon to proclaim afresh in each generation? Led by the Holy Spirit, it has borne witness to the Christian truth in its historic formularies, the 39 Articles of Religion, the Book of Common Prayer, and the ordering of bishops, priests, and deacons. In the declaration you are about to make, you will affirm your loyalty to this inheritance of faith as your inspiration and guidance under God in bringing the grace and truth of Christ to this generation and making him known to those in your care. Then I had to stand up before the bishop and before the people and say this, I, Simon Anthony Law, do so affirm and accordingly declare my belief in the faith which is revealed in the Holy Scriptures and set forth in the Catholic creeds and to which the historic formularies of the Church of England bear witness. And in public prayer and administration of the sacraments, I will use only the forms of service which are authorised or allowed by canon. And I had to hold a Bible in my right hand while I was saying it, just like taking an oath in a court. Uh, so the reason I'm telling you this is I think the gravity with which we have been entrusted with the word of God is absolutely crucial. So if we start saying, well, you know, it doesn't really matter if you do that or you do this or you don't do the other, then I think we are. We are guilty of sin. And, and Paul the Apostle goes on after that bit in 1 Corinthians and says, if anyone abuses the body and blood of Christ, they are guilty of sin and they bring judgment on themselves. His particular uh, grief was because um, people were gathering for worship. And instead of decently and in order breaking bread and drinking wine, they were having a, a, a party, you know, sort of chucking food about. And, and, and Paul very plainly says, look, when you have your meal, go home, you know, do, do your grub at home. But when you come to church, be decent, be orderly. Don't just, you know, think, oh, well, this is a, a bit of a scrum and we can all get involved in it. Which is one of the reasons why, if you remember back, it seems ages ago now, but when we had our, um, our Passover meal, our Maundy Thursday meal together, you know, yeah, great, get the kebabs, get the food, get eat it all, have a lot of fun. But then at the end of the meal, do you remember when Jesus said he took a piece of bread and he passed it around? At that point, everybody sort of <sighs> calms down. And yes, we're taking this seriously. We're breaking the bread, we're drinking the wine, and we're remembering what Jesus did for us. And um, that's what we must do. I don't think it matters whether we're um, slightly more informal when it comes to uh, Holy Communion. I mean, some of you will have known um, we've done a bit with the music uh, in the past. In fact, I was only saying the other day that Isaac and I ought to, one of the services that we record, we ought to record a rock setting of the communion that we did a few years ago and, and put that out as a, a an evening service sometime. I mean, but the thing is, whatever you do to the style of the service, you're not changing what it's about. And I think that's the really important thing. So I'm quite happy to go to a high Church of England thing with 
people lobbing incense about and dressed up in all sorts of robes. I mean, um, Chris will tell you, to Margaret's Bowes Gifford, they can, you know, turn on the style, definitely, definitely, and, and have a high church. Great, because that doesn't change the bread and the wine. And, and we can have a rock and roll service. It doesn't change the bread and the wine. We're still using Jesus' words. It's very, very important. And therefore we could, and we have done, um, had informal communions in our front rooms and, and whatever else. Um, it's what we believe that matters. We believe that Jesus died for us and rose from the dead. And he gave us this wonderful sacrament to remember what he did. But a sacrament is an outward sign of what's true. You believe it. We believe it. We're saved. We're part of the kingdom. We're on the list, however you want to describe it. But it's very, very important that very decently and in order we do what Jesus commanded us to do. And I am heartbroken that we cannot do it at the moment. And I'm looking forward to that time when we can, you know, come back into church, not just to pray, but actually to break bread and drink wine and proclaim our Lord's death until he comes. But in the meantime, Keep proclaiming it in your heart. Pray for those who are struggling. Uh, I mean, I mentioned earlier about being able to visit people who were dying. Well, of course, I can't at the moment. If any one of our number, I couldn't visit Doris. I knew she was dying, but I couldn't go. I was not allowed to. And it, it's, it's just incredibly heartbreaking to be in that position. But God promises that we will not be tested beyond our ability to endure. We can only rely on him in everything that we do. Amen. Now, just before you turn on and come back and discuss whatever, I want to sing. Um, if you've got uh, Songs of Fellowship, it's number 200, I Am the Bread of Life. Number 200 in Songs of Fellowship, I Am the Bread of Life. I'm sure you'll know this. Um, and uh, if you haven't got the words, the chorus, uh, I will raise him up, I will raise him up, I will raise him up on the last day. You can sing her if you like, but it, it's, it's generic, it's people. I just need to go and get a guitar, excuse me a moment. Right. It should work. I'll get in a position. Good 
Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Right, I'm just going to put this away and then if we want to chat for a bit, we may do so. You disappeared off my screen for some reason. Okay, you're back. Right. Um, if anybody would like to speak, um, please speak. Just if you if you want to speak and you want me to unmute you, stick your hand up, or uh, you can. Um, I heard a noise. Who's <laughs> Jean. Yes. Jean first. Fire away. I don't want to say anything, Simon. I'm just enjoying it. I just wanted to unmute and just say how much I've enjoyed it. <laughs> oh, that's fine. That's fine. Right. Uh, Sandria wants to. I'm just trying to find Sandria. I have. Um, that's it. Yes, you're unmuted. Yeah, she's well there. Sandria, speak. I don't need to say anything. I just, I just wanted to make sure I was unmuted. <laughs> you are. You're unmuted now, so you can speak. If you wish. Anybody want to speak? Chris, I think you need to unmute. Hang on. Uh, ah. Hang on, Chris, where are you? You try. Um, yeah, you're, you're in now. That's it. Come back. Okay. Following um, the death of Christ yep. and the resurrection and the ascension, would the disciples of carried on doing holy communion as such rather than the passover uh, yes i'm sure they would because um what's really interesting is they started meeting on sundays the week after easter right do, do you remember um the first easter sunday evening when jesus appeared after the two guys got back from Emmaus and he appeared to all the disciples. And do you remember Thomas wasn't there? Yes. And it, it then says, a week later, the disciples all met together and Thomas was with them. So the first Sunday after Easter was the first Sunday that they all met. And I think that's really, really interesting that almost, and um, in the book of Revelation, which was written by John, um, he has a very interesting um, phrase that when he gets his vision, he says that he was, because he was on the island of Patmos, um, a prisoner, I think, because he was a Christian. And he said, on the Lord's day, the spirit took control of me and I had a vision and he wrote all about it. And it's really interesting. It's that way round because in the Bible, when it says the day of the Lord, um, the day of the Lord always means the last day, the day of resurrection, you know, when, when Jesus comes back. So whenever you read about the day of the Lord, that means when the trumpet blows and blah, blah, blah. But when it was the other way around, the Lord's day, um, it's a slightly different construction. It means the day belonging to the Lord. And that was how the Christians referred to Sunday, which I think some of us still today, don't we? We call Sunday the Lord's day. Mm. Yes. as opposed to saturday which is the jewish sabbath for us sunday is the lord's day 
Yes. So okay. we're, we're, we're just doing a tradition that they've been doing from day one. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that was Marley. I thought Marley was going to ask a question. Then. <laughs> <laughs> See a poor going up. Woof, woof. <laughs> I must say it's lovely to have all of God's um, creation. If if I wasn't in my study, there'd probably be one or two cats um, running around. But uh, those of you that were at um, PCC uh, the other day on Zoom, Dave and Tina, their cats seem to be sort of <laughs> going between the two. Of them. <laughs> it was very funny, but very nice. Um, can I just say, uh, while there's a pause, I don't want to cut you off if you do want to ask anything, but in, in the light of um, our, our discussion at the PCC and about the services that we're having, um, I, I explained about the reason we'd stopped doing live streaming was because we had so much trouble with buffering and dropouts and all the rest of it. But um, we have decided, or I've decided with back up from the PCC that maybe some evening services to try doing it on Zoom like this when mm. there's a few people um, present which means we can do it live and it means you can react to um, the service afterwards so uh, God willing <laughs> okay, and technology willing um, this Sunday evening at half past six we'll do spiritual communion from the chapel next door on zoom i will send you the link and everything so that you can join in like this if if you don't um uh, want to participate in the live you can always catch up with the um the uh, the recording afterwards because like with this um when i stop recording uh an mp4 will be made of it automatically and then i'll put that on youtube so but if, if you want to join in, that'd be great. Because we found one spot in the chapel where we get good Wi-Fi, which those of you who listen in to Friday Night's Youth Fellowship, or like Tom, if you're Jackie, you're participating, I found a spot in, in the chapel where I can pick up the Wi-Fi from here. So otherwise I'd need about 120 foot um, Ethernet. <laughs> Our good mate Andy's made me a 60 foot one, but I'm not sure if he can extend to doubling the length, but you never know. Any other comments, questions uh, that you want to raise? If so, just unmute yourself and speak. I think it's just nice to see a full screen of people, you know, very good. Yeah, mm. yeah. I'm encouraged. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, we can um, on Sunday night, for example. I I I, I don't want to risk it on Sunday morning <laughs> because um, I, we've got a license for Zoom, which the parish has paid for, and it gives us up to a hundred participants. Well, believe it or not, some of our uh, morning services now have been viewed by over a hundred people. I mean, obviously they're playing catch up, but um, I, I'm not sure we want to upgrade the license at this point. It'd be nice to. But I, the other night, I was uh, the other day. I did diocesan synod, and there were 146 participants on the synod. So you can imagine my screen had got lots and lots of little, <laughs> little, <laughs> and we were all muted. And then when you spoke, you uh, you put your hand up and uh, and and so on. So um, yeah, it was good. Um, I, I think it was. Uh, yeah, it was great. Um, and so I think if we can do that on Sunday night, even if we have 10, 15 people, it'd be great. I mean, that's about the usual, it uh, used to be about the usual attendance for an evening service. Um, and I've noticed on catch up, you know, 10, 15 people have been watching the evening service as well. So that's good. But the morning's technically church parade. So I might have a few scout flags around and try and acknowledge the fact that the young people may be tuning in to, to listen, but then the evening we'll have our spiritual communion. Okay. Are you all... Well, happy's the wrong word, but well, well, I hope you are happy, but... Jean <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, is obviously... Sure, sure. 
Okay, well, I shall stop uh, the recording and then uh, we can formally say goodbye to each other. Well, no, let, let's, let's pray first uh, to finish and then I'll stop the recording and then we can say goodbye. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your institution of Holy Communion. Thank you for the wonderful sacrament where we remember your passion, that you died for us to take away our sins and you rose from the dead to give us the gift of life. In this time of lockdown, when we can't physically partake, we still pray that you would assure us of your salvation and that we would know deep in our hearts that you love us and that we are yours and that we shall live forever with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>